And then you realize that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and you build back towards it. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden. And we're here today for the Kara Golden Show with my next guest, who is so awesome. I'm so excited to hear his story. He is dialing in um, from the from the UK, Matt Greg Smith, and he is the co-founder and co-CEO of a company called Competitive Socializing. But he has this amazing, amazing brand that had started in London, but is now in the U.S. and is coming to more spots in the U.S. and it's called Swingers, the Crazy Golf Club. It is super, super great and I'm excited for them actually to open in New York as well by the spring, but you can go right now to D.C. Matt will talk a little bit more about that. But as I mentioned, Matt is the co-founder and co-CEO of Competitive Socializing, which is a U.K.-based company that is combining indoor sports with great food and drinks. And they're also the parent company for the brand Swingers. And it's an incredible place where you can do mini golf and, like I said, get cocktails. They have street food and lots of fun music. So he co-founded it with a partner, Jeremy Simmons, in 2014. And they launched it as a five-month pop-up in London's Shoreditch neighborhood. And it was such a success that he decided, why not come across the water and open it in the U.S., which I am so excited that he did. And and before entering into the world of hospitality, Matt was in marketing, uh, founding Rough Hill, a youth marketing and experiential agency. And he was also a consultant at Seed Marketing. Um, so really digging into kind of what people are looking for and uh trends as as well. Um, he was also listed just as some of to name off some of his accolades. Um, he was listed as one of the Sunday Times Maserati 100 and which recognizes game changing entrepreneurs. Matt, did you get a Maserati? You don't get a Maserati. Thing? What's that about? Uh, I mean, what is that about? Right. I'm so excited to have you here. So I'll, I will be quiet now. Well, I'll continue asking you. No, questions, I like the way you were welcome. explaining it. I was I was really enjoying it. I was riveted. <laughs> I, I love it. So welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's start at the beginning. So who who was Matt? You grew up in the UK. Uh, I tell, did. tell us a little bit more about, you know, the the entrepreneur and, and the younger version of yourself. Well, I grew up in a village outside a town called Tunbridge Wells, which is about an hour from uh, London. So it's kind of a commuter area and people would get the train from the leafy area that I lived in into central London. And my dad was one of those people. Um, he is a lawyer uh, and my mum also as a lawyer. And it's funny, I when I think was I entrepreneurial as a kid? Uh, it's a really weird mix because my instinct was to say, no, I absolutely wasn't. I kind of just did my thing. But the more I thought about it, I realized I w was always hustling in some way. I was, I had a paper round, which when I was thinking about it, it paid me 15p per paper that I delivered, which was big Sunday times that I was loading onto into bags and cycling around this village, which now I just don't think you'd get away with having a 14 year old kid uh, laden down with newspapers, uh, delivering them around in quite that way. Um, I was always selling something, looking for an opportunity. Um, and weirdly, when I was at school, people would talk about business and I would think it was this completely different thing. I was never that good at maths when I was at school. I always, you know, where they set you into different classes uh, according to ability. I was always kind of near the bottom. And it was this weird thing where I thought, oh, business will be for other people. You can't do business. If you, for some reason, if you can't do trigonometry and you can't do algebra, then you'd never be able to do business. And it was this kind of remote concept. But then as I kind of progressed through school and to university, I realized that there's actually no trigonometry and no algebra involved in business, or very rarely. And you just need to be able to add and subtract, which I could do. And when I was at college, I found myself setting up a business. So I guess there was an entrepreneur in there after all. What was your business in college? The business you mentioned, it was called Rough Hill. And we started out by organizing 
club nights for students. So you would get bars in uh, these college towns, which would be really busy on weekends, but during the week they would have no footfall. So the deal was they would say, we'll put on some kind of drinks promotion, which to give you some context was usually along the lines of a single vodka and a mixer for £1.50 or a double vodka mixer for £2.50. So it was kind of aimed at the... uh, price conscious binge drinker, uh, which a lot of college students were, but we would um, create a brand, we would put DJs on, um, and we would market it throughout these college campuses as the place to be and get big numbers of people into these venues. So these were weekly events and they would do between one and 2000 people at each event. So we we built up and we built up. And I think by the time I came to do my final exams at uh, college, I think we were probably running in about six or seven cities and turning over about £250,000, which is, I don't know, $400,000 a year. Um, so I somehow managed to get through my exams, actually did pretty decently, and it became a full-time business after we left college. That's wild. What inspired you to start a business in college? I mean, what what drove you to do it? Were, I don't did, know. Was I, it money? Was it curious? I mean, like, where do you remember? Like, I don't think it was money. I think it was, I got introduced to the concept of running a club night by a friend of mine who was doing one. And he was doing it for the love of music. It was a kind of a funk soul mm-hmm. night. And he needed someone to help him organize it. And there was something about the organizational side of it, the efficiency. I wanted to come in and run it better and make it better and I could see opportunities. So while my friend was kind of out talking to the guests and making sure the music was just right, I was in the background kind of trying to make it the best possible event. But then obviously if you run some successful events, then you can make some money from it. And that's quite nice, that feeling of success and uh, being part of something that's working. So I guess it kind of fuels from there. Yeah, no, I think it's it's the traction of it too. It's it's uh it it sort of drives you that you start to get this formula and then maybe the next time you do it, you tweak the formula slightly and then you exactly. just keep adding on to yeah. it. So it's uh it's funny. I had a Amanda Freeman on here a, a couple couple months ago and she started a brand in New York called SLT um that is an exercise studio it's pretty successful it's on um it's on reformers and anyway mm-hmm. it's the hardest class you'll ever do in your life uh it's it's crazy and she's like a serial entrepreneur she started a bunch of different things but she went to university and she started delivering pizzas and uh and she said it was like the same kind of thing like she just figured out like part of it was money but for her like she figured she it was like the social aspect of it a little bit like she started meeting people i said really like you actually met people when you delivered pizza and she said yeah people were asking her hey do you want a slice and <laughs> Yeah. Like this whole conversation around it, but she said f- for her it was even more interesting how she could do like like add-ons to um, different parts of it. Anyway, I just found yeah, it interesting. I think I, think I could relate to that because yeah. I I think when I got to college, I had a shock about how few hours you actually had to do as part of the college program. So I was doing um, a degree in English literature and politics, mm-hmm. and I think I had maybe seven or eight hours of contact time um, with tutors in between lectures and tutorials um, every week. And then obviously you have to do reading as well, but it all felt very relaxed and very slow. And I think I just needed something with a bit more energy. I needed a project, something to get involved in. So I just made the most of my time and did my degree and ran a business, which I love it. Looking back seems strange, but at the time it made perfect sense. Yeah. And probably a lot of things that you learned along the way in terms of, you know, managing budgets, you could, you know, if you're doing flyers, I guess that was probably more of a thing than even, right. And it's just how much are you going to spend for that versus how many are you going to get out? You would know what the return was, Mm -hmm. but I, it's such a valuable experience. So you left school and, and eventually transitioned into an ad agency. What were you doing for the agency? When we were running Rough Hill, this club night business, we were, 
doing a huge number of events every single week, um, probably 25, 30 events, um, which, as I said, range from about one to 2,000 people. And the kind of engine of that, the way that we were making it happen was by having this youth marketing team in every college city that we were in in the UK. So, And they were made up of all the kind of the key people as we that we identified so it might be people on sports teams people in different clubs and societies and on different lecture programs and so we would go and find kids who would then promote it to their peer group and through that we kind of got noticed to start with by brands who would say hey we really want to reach the youth audience and it's a bit of a dark art we don't know how to do that can you help us and then eventually uh, a few agencies said to us oh you can reach the youth market in this cool credible way and we started talking to them and in the end one of them acquired us so it was a big ad agency called vccp who were top five top 10 in the in london and they were looking to build out their roster of um expertise and so by acquiring us they got to add youth marketing but they could also take our events uh expertise um and bring that in-house as well so they bought us we joined this huge London ad agency, which was kind of a shock to the system, um, but so carried on running the business. But then they helped us develop out the youth marketing, but also the brands that they had would come to us and say, we are online and kind of household brands help us to create events, help us to create create experiences. Um, so that's what we did there. One of the things uh, that you that you did and you became known for was competitive socializing. Can you talk a little bit about that? As we were coming out of uh, our time within the agency, we were finishing our earnout, and we the, being in an agency was kind of tough. And it was you know we spent a few years where we weren't masters of our own destiny. We'd been used to running our own thing, and uh, we learned. A huge amount while we were within the agency and I think it professionalized us a lot but we were desperate to get back to doing our own thing so we had this unique perspective where we knew how to create experiences and we knew about nightlife and so we looked around the market thinking what are we going to do next and at the time you could play in London you could play ping pong in a kind of a ping pong bar or you could go and do upscale bowling and we said what if you could play what we call crazy golf and Americans call mini golf? What if you could do that in a really cool theatrical immersive venue where the food and drink is amazing, will bring you cocktails while you play, uh, and it's an incredible um incredible experience from start to finish and we suggested it to a few friends we said to our friends if we did this do you think it would be good like would you come and play crazy golf drink cocktails and eat great burgers and it was a universal oh my word yes we would and we were used to being in an ad, ad agency where we were trying to sell ideas to people the whole time and you always have to convince people and do these pitches and they'd be like oh i'm not so sure um and you'd be kind of just selling all the time and then suddenly we were saying to people mini golf uh a night out with mini golf burgers cocktails what do you think and people were, were like yes I would do that. I w please, will you do it so I can book it for my birthday? So that was the kind of genesis of the idea. And um, it kind of grew from there. That's awesome. Was there anybody else who was doing golf in in London? No, we we were the first. So it was nice to have that first mover advantage. And this was the end of 2014. And we decided to test the concept by doing a pop-up, first of all. So we found a warehouse space that was 7,000 square feet in Shoreditch, as you said, which is in East London. And we built it out and it was uh, one course um, and then we themed it like the English countryside. So we built a clubhouse within the warehouse as well. Uh, and we had brought in two street food brands um, because we, like I said, we wanted the food to be awesome. And often when you do these kind of experiences, leisure experiences, the food can be pretty hit and miss. And we wanted the food to be really good. And so, yeah, we had a course, two bars, clubhouse, two street food vendors, and we started marketing it. Um, like I said, at 
September 2014. And we launched with a website that was called The Nudge, who had a subscriber base of 15,000 people in London. And they were all people that wanted to find out about the next big thing in nightlife. But this email went out saying, Swingers is coming. This is how it works. And that email is still to date their most shared email because it got forwarded another 140,000 times. And it was basically people sending it to their friends saying, we've got to do this. We've got to do this. This looks like it's a whole lot of fun. So uh, our website crashed. We were completely overbooked. It was a logistical nightmare, but a good logistical nightmare if there's how was it different than what you had done in college? I mean, what did you, you know, from from doing bars? I mean, I guess maybe the, the amount of time, right, that right. you're booking. I mean, it's all day. So, yeah, the two big differences. One, it's like an event that never ends or, you know, the pop up was always scheduled to be five to six months. So it's an event that goes on for five or six months, which is kind of crazy to wrap your head around. But you can that bit's kind of easy easier to get to grips with. I think the key difference was when we were doing these club events um, at college, We all we were doing, we were selling the tickets and we were getting people through the doors But and, and we were putting on a DJ. But after that, we were kind of giving the attendees to the venue and saying, they're your problem now. You run this venue, you get them drinks, you make sure it's all run um, very safely and there's no health and safety issues. And suddenly we became the operator in this context. So we were running the bars. We obviously weren't running the food because we were bringing that in, but the whole venue was ours to run and figure out. And with that comes till systems and ordering liquor and, you know, how to build a venue that's going to last for five or six months or longer. So it was... We'd always said, why would you operate a venue when you could just promote it? And then here we were suddenly with our own venue and people desperate to come to it. And then we started looking for proper permanent locations. Wow, I love it. And so how many locations now do you have in the UK? We just have two in uh, London. We have one in the financial district, which is kind of central East London. Mm -hmm. And then we have one in the West End, which uh, right by Oxford Circus and Regent Street. So kind of the prime shopping area prime area That's and these awesome. venues they're like twenty thousand square feet so they're big they're big beasts and they so they neatly straddle central london and each one's got too many golf courses four food vendors a hundred plus staff so yeah we're not and we're not probably not going to open another one in uh, london for a little while especially on the back of the pandemic so but that that's that's a whole lot of business we can do from those two yeah, we'll get to the pandemic in a second, but I, I'm so curious. So you opened, when did you open the one in Washington in DC? Uh, that opened in June of this year. So we've been open okay. three, four months, something like that. And how has that been? I guess well, let's start in on the pandemic. I mean, first of all, launching during the pandemic. I mean, how how was that? The pandemic was crazy. It kind of affected us more in London because we were trading and business was good. And we would we had two sites open in London. We'd done a fundraise not so long before. So we were in a growth phase. We were all about making plans and we were looking ahead. And it was this business that we'd been working working on for nearly, I guess, seven years. And you know, it's like when you build a business and it's block by block and hire by hire and finding all the right people. And then suddenly overnight, it ground to a halt and we we shut our doors and we turned off the lights. And in London, you know, nobody, it was a long, long lockdown. I think it was longer than a lot of the US lockdowns and we were, we were in and out. So it was soul destroying to start with because we had to kind of dismantle the business in part. There were, we couldn't employ, carry on employing everybody in the business. Although luckily the UK furlough scheme actually was quite supportive in the end. And it was just a lot of uncertainty. We, that, you know, no one had any visibility over what was coming. And so we had to try and look after our team who we couldn't see in person, who were made up of a lot of people in their early 20s sat at home in their bedrooms with nothing to do. So it was it was a crazy period. And then we opened and closed a few times in London with varying lockdown phases. And all the while in DC, we were still fitting out our location because construction kind of went back to normal in the US relatively quickly. 
And so we only opened our DC locations slightly later than planned. And there we were just waiting on the local city regulations um, to kind of allow us to open um, in the way that we wanted to. But uh, we opened in June and we were really lucky actually because it was the um a lot of the regulations got relaxed a week or so beforehand so our launch party was one of the first launches um that we had um that the people have been to in the in dc in a while so there was a lot of enthusiasm for us to come to a venue like ours um because it was one of the first parties back how do you think it's changed in terms of everything from do you ask people not to switch clubs or, you know, all that kind of stuff? I'm so curious, like, has it been difficult for you to put these processes in place? Um, obviously, it's necessary, but was there a lot of extra stuff that you had to do in the background in order to change your business in any way? Yeah, there was. I mean, I think there was a lot of, um, like you say, this kind of hygiene stuff, which is really important. And people just want to feel uh, safe when they go out and they want to see that um, hygiene is being taken seriously. Um, so, yeah, that's become a big component, extra layers of training. And, you know, they're all good things to be doing anyway, and they will last now in perpetuity. Um, but then also just we had to go through these various phases of people could only order while sitting down or, you know, people, whereas we're used to being a bit more of a bar environment, we had to come up with um, systems um, for ordering um, so people could stay seated. And so we've thought about tech a lot in our business. And although our experience is it's, itself is essentially quite analog, you know, you're playing mini golf, you're hitting balls with clubs. Um, we, it's quite a old school experience. We have windmills and trees and, um, it's, yeah, it's quite traditional around it. We want to make sure that tech really helps the consumer experience. And so we've, brought in QR codes and we brought in um, a web app. So when you can sit down, you can order, you can order food and drinks and they'll be brought to you. So we're just always looking at the ways tech can help the guest experience. And that has definitely been um, accelerated by the pandemic and the impact of it. Absolutely. So you, it's still set up the same way. You're not missing, guests aren't missing out on anything. It's more it's behind essentially the, the same stuff. experience. In DC at the moment, there's a mask mandate. So that's definitely making things challenging because if you're moving around the room and you're not eating and drinking, you do have to wear a mask and that doesn't link easily into the social experience. But no, right. at its core, Swingers is still the same beast that it was pre-pandemic, which is great. Yeah, definitely. I feel like people are still functioning with the masks though. I've been in many cities throughout the last few weeks, which still have mask mandates inside restaurants and people are still functioning and talking and socializing. They're not allowing that to stop them. So I, I think it's an important, you know, thing to remember. Well, it's, it's, it's so interesting to see how the mask mandate impacted things because we were trading in DC before the mandate and we knew there was a possibility one might come in and we thought, well, people will just carry on now. They're like back out of lockdown, people will just carry on. And what we didn't kind of expect was that as soon as the mask mandate came out, all our corporate business dropped away because as a corporate entity, if the city is telling you that there's a pan, you know, there's risk and um, that there is an increased uh, risk of infection infection, you can't really in good conscience gather your employees together for some kind of event. So the corporate business dropped away, but we're saying privately consumers, they're not feeling the risk. They're, they've been stuck at home for a long time. They want to get back out. So people can either book as a group through our sales team to come to us, or they can buy tickets online. And the online tickets are still selling like crazy. It's just the corporates can't hold events in quite the same way. So it's interesting to see that dichotomy and you kind of need the local, the, you know, the city council or whatever to say, actually, you don't need to wear masks anymore. And then the corporates will get their confidence back and we'll get our all our business back. Yeah. I mean, I think 2022, a lot of people are booking those things. And I think I don't know. I personally think they're still going to go on. Yeah. Um, I think people, I think corporations are getting a lot more comfortable in the U.S. Uh, I can't speak to the U.K., but as to what 
they will allow their teams to do because I think a lot of people are really feeling like they need to get people back together and they'll do it in a smaller scale. Um, so smaller meetings, but definitely I feel like it, they're definitely starting to come back because I think people believe too that whether you have a mask mandate or not, I think people believe that, you know, to some extent this is not going away, right? It's it's uh, not for the foreseeable future and we're going to have to always you know, be ready for that in some way. So the UK is crazy right now. I mean, we're talking it's mid October, but it's kind of like COVID didn't exist now in the UK. The regulations have all been relaxed. We are doing crazy levels of bookings in our two locations. That's People are booking terrific. for Christmas. So it's strange. And I met a lady from LA yesterday and she came in for a meeting and she was like, what is going on here? She couldn't believe it. Yeah. yeah. And I travel and I kind of get confused about when I'm supposed to be wearing a mask and what the local regulations are. But yeah, London and the UK is currently going off the chart. People just want to have fun. I was in a, I was at a conference. I just got back from Hawaii oh, nice. and, um, yeah, it was terrific, but it was on the Island of Maui and the conference actually it was about a hundred people at the conference. And every morning, um, we had to go and get the antibody, uh, or sorry, the, the see whether or not, uh, we had COVID. Um, and, and in order to get on the Island of Hawaii, you actually have to be vaccinated, I believe, or you have to have had a negative test yeah. and antigens or something. So, um, there's a lot, I, I think even for people that are a little nervous about it, they're figuring out ways to still go on right. in some way. And so every day we had to have, we had these tests in our room when we, checked in and every morning we had to go and take the test, uh, and, uh, to a counter and, uh, and then get a wristband and, you know, everybody functioned that way. And people and then once like, you've done that, some, it was like life was normal or it felt very normal, right? Yeah, We didn't wear masks. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was, um, I think in the hotel we had to wear a mask. Um, but the rest of the conference, once we were in the rooms, you didn't have to wear a mask because everybody had been, had this, um, testing done. So I, again, I think people are really in this phase of saying like, we're not going to stop. We're still going to do this. And you know, we're, how do we we're going to, right. We're going to have to figure out what way we can live with it. So anyway, but so what do you think I, I, I've heard you say that you still have to push through, right? You have to continue to push through. Obviously you opened up a new center and, you know, even with these mask mandates, I, I, I often think about like the most challenging times are really, especially as an entrepreneur and a leader is when we really not only learn a lot about ourselves, but about kind of things that we're meant to learn. And if we go back and look at, you know, even what you've learned over the last 18 months, it's, it, it's, uh, how do you think it's prepared you in some way that maybe you just didn't really know this about yourself prior to this period of time? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the roller coaster that everybody's been on through this period. And like I said, we were in this kind of growth phase where we were thinking this is the future and we're going to expand. And we had all these amazing plans and overnight the venues went dark. And, you know, there were a few weeks where I thought I genuinely don't know what the future looks like. Is the world going to return to normal when it when it, some kind of normality comes back, are people going to do this mass socializing anymore? Like maybe we're done, but like this might be the end of the business and who saw it coming. And then you realize that actually there is a light at the end of the tunnel and you build back towards it. So it was a, you know, a long way back. And I've definitely learned a lot about resilience and, you know, it was, it was tough that period of trying to figure out how the business was going to survive. Like I can't, you know, my pandemic, I can't complain. And there are people that had really tough times and did amazing things. My, it was personally a challenge, just that kind of trying to figure out how to make the business survive and sitting on endless zoom calls for essentially a year in London, trying to make it survive. But it, we really learn a lot about who, how we work together as a team and a lot about everybody within our organization and 
we looked out for each other and we communicated with each other. And it was amazing that all the investment that everyone had put into each other over a number of years really kind of paid off and people dug deep and everybody really gave their best to to try and secure the future of the business. So it was just about that collective purpose and, you know, you really realized how investing in a team over a period of years can pay dividends when you get to a difficult moment like this. Definitely. Did you feel like you led differently during this time? I guess the day that you were shut down, I mean, did you feel like as a leader, you had to maybe sort of go outside of the manual of sort of what you thought was like a, as a CEO and, and you had to lead from the dark basically, because everybody panicked and then everyone looked to Jeremy and I to say, what's going to happen? What's the future? And we had no idea what the future was looking like. We didn't know if the business was going to survive, but you can't turn around and tell people that. So we said to people, it is going to be all right. We're going to figure out a way to get through this. You know, these are the next steps we're going to take. And yeah, it was, we were walking in the dark essentially. And people would say to us, what's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? You think, I know no more than you do. I don't get any kind of governmental updates. There's no kind of hotline for entrepreneurs saying, okay, this is what this is what's going to happen next in this pandemic. So I think it was that kind of blind faith. And in the pre-pandemic, you always knew roughly what was going on and you knew where the, the, the direction of travel. And this was like put a really brave face on it, smile and reassure people because, you know, and just take each day at a time. I had my own experience during this time too, where we're an essential product and uh, an FDA regulated an essential product in the U S uh, not all bottled water in the U S is actually FDA regulated. Right. Uh, it's regulated by the States, but because we use fruit in our product, we're regulated by the FDA. And so when you go into pandemic status, which in my lifetime has never happened yeah. in the US. Uh, you have to run your plants 24 hours a day. Uh, you have to use best efforts to support uh, your stores to make sure that shelves are stocked. Uh, so while everybody was sheltering in place, uh, it's in, in most companies, um, in an FDA regulated company uh, during a pandemic, you actually have to tell your team that you're not sheltering in place. Yeah. You're out there. And so I talk a lot about, you know, I the only way I knew how to lead was actually to get out there myself mm-hmm. and actually make sure that it was safe and try and figure out strategies to be the s- safest as possible. So created our own hand sanitizer because I thought many of them, first of all, we couldn't get them most of in the early days, but then a lot of it smelled rancid. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and Anyway, fast forward, you know, 18 months, I tell people we've been working through the entire thing. Friends who were not essential workers would say to me, like, can I go to the grocery store? I mean, is it is it really bad? And I'm like, you know, I go first thing in the morning after no one's been in the store overnight. And maybe hopefully, you know, it's calmed down a little bit. The, if there is any problems, bacteria problems, maybe hopefully it's not sitting there or there's less people, all of those kind of things. And so I think, you know, more than anything, I totally agree with you that it's dark. Uh, but as an entrepreneur, I also think that maybe it was dark in the beginning, right? When you first got started, you didn't sort of, you had a big plan but then the plans changed for various mm-hmm. reasons. And so this was just one more chapter in the book. But I uh, I think it's most fun to look back on the times that have been the most challenging because I really do think that it it makes you stronger. It makes you more resilient to your point. And uh, you've done an incredible job. And I'm so excited for your success to be coming to the U.S. too and, and uh, very excited to visit you're one in New York and in the spring as well. That'll be really, really terrific and a great location. You said too, down in the Flatiron. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be at 29th and Broadway in a a basement space underneath the Virgin Hotel, uh, which is coming soon. 
Oh, that's terrific. That's really, really great. Well, this is so fun. Thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find, like, follow you, Matt, and then also just find out more about Swingers? Uh, I'm on social media at Matt Grecksmith. Uh, Swingers is uh, at Swingers US. Uh, website is www.swingers.club. Make sure you take a note of that properly and don't type anything else because you might see some things, but <laughs> www.swingers.club dot club uh, and we're open in dc right now and we'll be in new york from march next year 2022 that's terrific well thank you so much for sharing the journey and thanks everyone for listening uh if as you know we're here every monday and wednesday talking to incredible founders and ceos about their journey and building their brand and uh hopefully you'll get a chance to uh hear some of the other podcasts on the Kara Golden Show. If you haven't listened already, uh, definitely download the podcast. It's on Apple as well as Spotify. And thanks so much for listening, everyone. If you also haven't had a chance to pick up a copy of my book, which I cannot even believe it's been a year since I launched it. It's a Wall Street Journal and Amazon bestseller. Uh, and hopefully you'll get a chance to read it or listen to it on Audible and hear a lot more about uh, some of the challenges um, that we've had in, in building our brand. Uh, but anyway, goodbye for now. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the week.